So, uh, hi everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, we're happy to have Karim El Badri uh, visiting us today and tomorrow. Uh, so, Karim did his PhD in Berkeley, uh, followed by a postdoc at uh, Harvard CFA. And uh, he started as a faculty at Caltech uh, this August. And uh, Karim has worked on a wide variety of topics. More recently, I guess. Uh, binaries and associated uh, stellar evolution. And today you'll be telling us about uh, dormant black holes in our galaxies and uh, how to find them. Take it All right, thanks for the introduction. Thanks everyone for coming. <clears throat> so dive right in. Uh, I will say, feel free to interrupt me during the talk if, uh, if I say anything that's not clear. So my background slide here is a picture of the star Zeta Off. So Zeta Off is a bright star, it's third magnitude, you can see it with the naked eye. Uh, and it's the nearest O star to the sun. So it's the nearest star that we think has a good chance probably of becoming a black hole when it dies. Uh, and it, it's blowing a strong wind. And it's moving pretty fast compared to the environment around it. And so it blows this bow shock that you can see in this infrared image. So there are something like 20,000 O stars like Zeta off in the Milky Way. Uh, we know that because we can basically count them. They're, they're bright, you can see them at uh, large distances. Uh, they're energetically very important for the, the evolution of galaxies. They're one of the main sources of energy and momentum in the ISM. And uh, they don't live very long, so the typical lifetime of a star like Zeta off is something like 5 million years, and then they explode maybe, or maybe they just collapse. Uh, and so what that means is that for every one of these stars that we can see today, there must be lots more that we can't see anymore that have already died. And so to get a rough estimate of, of how many of those there might be and how many black holes there should be in the Milky Way, we can take the number of, of O stars we see today and then multiply by the ratio of their lifetime to the age of the galaxy, we get something like two times 10 to the seven black holes in the Milky Way. This is a pretty uncertain number. Uh, first of all, we don't know exactly which stars become black holes, uh, which ones leave behind neutron stars or no remnant. And also the star formation rate in the Milky Way has varied by a factor of a few, uh, but it should be in this ballpark. And so uh, another way you can think of this is zeta off is about 100 parsecs away, the order of 100 parsecs. Uh, and so uh, there should be about 1,000 black holes for every O star we see today. So a factor of 1,000 in, in volume is a factor of 10 in distance. And so the nearest black hole should be uh, on, on the order of 10 parsecs away. Pretty close. So where are all those black holes? Uh, well, there are a few that we can study and that have been studied over the years. Uh, the first is this population of X-ray binaries. We have a black hole uh, accreting from a massive star or more often a low mass star. Uh, there are about 20 of these with dynamical mass measurements. Uh, most of them discovered already a few decades ago, uh, shown here. Uh, and so in all these systems, you have a black hole with a star that's so close to it that the black hole is, is almost eating the star. Or it's, uh, for most of them, it's in the process of, of slowly eating the star, but that can go on for hundreds of millions of years. Uh, and so when material falls onto the black hole, uh, it releases a lot of gravitational potential energy, gets really hot in an accretion disk, uh, order a million Kelvin. And so these kinds of systems we can see in X-rays when they have outbursts. You can see them all across the Milky Way and sometimes in nearby galaxies. Uh, and then in addition to those 20 or so, so there are 20 where we, we know they're black holes because we can measure the velocity of the star going around. And then uh, if we have an estimate of the mass of the star and we see how fast it's going, that gives us a minimum mass for the companion. And say, it's dynamically confirmed to me that it's too massive to be a, a neutron star, so we think it's a black hole. Uh, then there are another 50 or so that we think are probably black holes based on their X-ray properties. They have the same kind of outbursts and the same kind of spectra in X-rays, uh, but where we haven't been able to make dynamical measurements of the mass, basically in most cases because they're too far away, so they're very faint in the optical, but 
have a lot of dust in between. Uh, and so here's a plot of the number of systems uh, known as a function of time. And you can see it's been increasing kind of linearly for the last uh, 50 years almost. Uh, but the number of dynamically confirmed system is kind of plateaued in the last 20 years. And that's because most of the new systems we're finding are far away behind a lot of dust in the Milky Way. And so we can't do the follow up observations to measure velocities. Uh, and then you can also look for black holes by microlensing. So far, there's only one confident detection like this. Uh, but the idea is you monitor the brightness and position of a star on the sky really precisely. And if a black hole moves across your line of sight, uh, it'll both make the star brighter and distort its position. You can measure that distortion. You can measure the mass of the lensing object. And so there's, there's one object discovered a couple of years ago now where that mass is, is in the ballpark of eight solar masses. It's almost definitely black. So we have, you know, on the ballpark of, of, of 20 or 100, depending on which ones you count, known black holes. Uh, but it's a, it's pretty far short of the 10 to the 7 or 10 to the 8 uh, that we think should exist. Uh, another way you can think of that, as I said, the nearest one should be something like 10 parsecs away. Uh, but in this population, if you look at, 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 at distances to all of these, the closest one is actually one and a half kiloparsecs. So it's like a factor of 100 farther uh, than the nearest one should be. So, so probably something like one in, one in a million black holes that are out there we're seeing so far. I, so uh, one way you can think of this is like an iceberg. Uh, and there are some black holes we can study uh, easily now. These are the ones that are X-ray bright, and then also the ones that are merging uh, through gravitational waves. Uh, and those are, are bright, uh, either in, in uh, electromagnetic light or in gravitational waves, uh, but are probably a rare outcome of binary evolution. So for example, for the gravitational wave ones, if you wanted to find one of those in the Milky Way, you have to wait something like 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 8 years until one of them happens to merge in the Milky Way. Uh, and then underneath, uh, we think there's this bigger population either of, of black holes and binaries that are more widely separated. So same kind of idea as, as X-ray binaries, but no mass transfer onto the black hole. Or uh, probably even more common, uh, black holes that are isolated and are not orbiting anything. Uh, which you can maybe find by by microlensing, but but not many other ways. I uh, so I, I started five years ago ago or so trying to find these kind of non-accreting black holes, uh, and uh, focusing mostly on the kind that are in binaries. And other people started before that. Uh, so already before anybody ever detected a, a black hole in an X-ray binary, there were these two papers in the in the sixties by. Uh, Zeldovich, uh, Gusanov uh, and Zeldovich, and then Kip Thorne and Virginia Trimble, all of whom uh, went on to become famous for other things. Uh, and uh, what they did is basically look at this sample of known spectroscopic binaries at the time that had orbits and say, are there any where the mass that you infer from the spectroscopic orbit is more than the mass of the luminous star you see? So the companion seems to be more mass than the star you see. That would be a candidate for or a dark passive object. And so the first one, first paper made a list of candidates, but maybe these, and the second paper a few years later looked more carefully at a bigger sample and said, well, there are some more candidates, uh, but, but in all of these systems, other explanations are possible. Uh, and at the time, there are only a thousand or so spectroscopic binaries known. And so uh, by now we found that probably the, the number you have to look at before you have a good chance of finding one of these kind of black hole companions is more like, like a million. So with a thousand, it wasn't surprising that they didn't find anything. Uh, but then a few years later, there was the discovery of the first one of these X-ray binaries, Cygnus X1. And so the way this worked was first, there was an X-ray source covered already in the, in the late 60s. At uh, first, not localized very well, uh, but then it got localized better. And astronomers noticed that there was a an O star at the same place of the X-ray source, and they measured velocities of the O star in the right panel there. Uh, and from those velocities and some guess for the mass of the O star, you can infer a minimum mass of whatever it must be orbiting. The minimum mass at the time was, was something like five solar masses, but 
certainly more than than uh, we thought a neutron star uh, or massive neutron star could have. And so the evidence uh, was already pretty strong that it was a black hole. And of course, this system has been studied in a lot of detail since then. Uh, so then more years passed. Uh, there were some more searches for these non accreting binaries, uh, and uh, but they didn't find any. Uh, but but we kept detecting more and more of these X-ray binaries, including uh, systems like Cygnus X1, but also low mass X-ray binaries. We have a star like the Sun, basically, uh, or the low mass. Can I ask a very quick question on the previous one? So you said uh, a few times since the four for the Roche lobe filling lifetime. So right so. before the Roche lobe overflow. Uh, it just looks like a single lined uh, binary with no other signs, right? So, so you would only see that as a dynamical. Yeah, so that's that's one of the, so I didn't uh, say this clearly, so thanks for pointing it out. One of the interesting things with Cygnus X1 is that the O star almost fills its Roche lobe. It's like 98% Roche lobe filling. So there's much more material falling onto the black hole than there would be normally. Uh, it's still technically wind accretion, but it's like much, it's just a much higher M dot, a slower wind. And so you can imagine if you look, you know, the system probably looked similar to this, but just not as Roche lobe filling for 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 6 years. Uh, and at that point, you still probably get some X rays from accretion, from wind accretion, but just much less. Uh, and O stars produce some X rays on their own anyway. So it's harder to, to distinguish that kind of weak wind accretion from uh, or X rays from just. And so once it starts Roche lobe accretion, it just uh, keeps uh, accreting. Basically, it's a is it random? Is it a random or not? Uh, so Cygnus X one, we think the the black hole now we think is something like twenty solar masses, and the O star is something like thirty. So I think Cygnus X one will be stable mass transfer for for at least. Uh, uh, yeah, for a while. I think the most likely outcome you have stable mass transfer eventually you get a wide black hole neutron star binary. Okay, so some years passed, no dormant black holes, no dormant black holes. Uh, one of the, the developments was starting 20 years ago or something, uh, there was a proliferation of lots of wide field surveys in the Milky Way, getting a mixture of radial velocities of stars, uh, light curves, uh, and spectra. Uh, and so at this point, you expect some of these surveys probably observed some stars orbiting black holes. Uh, the question is just to figure out which ones. Uh, and so what we, you know, one thing you'd like is orbits from radial velocities for all of them. Uh, but that's difficult because in most cases, these surveys only get uh, one or a few radial velocities. Uh, so they're not enough to fit an orbit. And then from light curves, you know, you can get an orbital period, but you can't usually get a containing mass. Uh, but so this, this, uh, Data kind of made brought this uh, turned this problem into a, a big data problem, combing through data sets uh, and looking for uh, for anomalous objects. Uh, so then, right about the same time, we started discovering uh, black holes merging in gravitational waves with LIGO, uh, and by now there are more than a hundred of these. Uh, and so here's a plot just showing the compact remnant population from. LIGO and other sources. The y-axis is mass, the x-axis is nothing. Uh, and so the here and shown in blue are the gravitational wave mergers uh, of black holes. Uh, uh, those are all at cosmological distances. Uh, and then in purple are black holes in the Milky Way, mostly from those X-ray binaries. And then uh, in yellow at the bottom uh, are neutron stars mostly radio pulsars in the Milky Way. And so obviously a, a, a lot has been written about this diagram. Uh, I'll just point out a, a couple things. Uh, so one is that if you look at the distribution of number of objects that function of mass, uh, there are a lot of one to two solar mass neutron stars, and then a lot of black holes starting at about five solar masses or so, uh, but there's not much in between. Uh, and there are now some, uh, fairly confident objects in the gap. So if there's a gap, uh, it's probably not barren, but it's at least a bimodality. And so that might tell us something about uh, what happens when massive stars die, you know, what fraction of, of the envelope falls into the core versus eject, being ejected. But it could also uh, reflect 
something about what kinds of black holes we can find in the first place, right? We're, we're only finding uh, the ones in these gravitational wave sources and X-ray binaries could be a, a biased population. Um, and then another thing to point out is that almost all of the black holes we see merging in gravitational waves already before they formed, both of the individual black holes were more massive than the black holes that we see locally in X-ray binaries. And so in some sense, as expected, because more massive black holes make louder gravitational wave signals, so there's a selection bias in that favor. Uh, but nevertheless, we don't have local analogs of these kind of massive black holes. Uh, and if you just take uh, stellar evolution models, it's hard to make black holes that massive uh, out of the kind of stars in the Milky Way today because the winds blow away all their envelopes. And so even if you start with a really massive star, you form a low mass, you know, 10-ish solar mass black hole. And so we'd like to find some local analogs of these. I should say the, the preferred explanation right now is they form from low metallicity stars, which is quite plausible because they have weaker winds and so they lose less of their envelopes. But so far that's a, an untested prediction. Uh, and, and so if we, we can map some of the low metallicity black holes in the Milky Way, we could test that. Okay, and then uh, shortly after we started finding these uh, black holes uh, with gravitational waves, there was also a, a slew of proposed uh, dormant black hole candidates in the Milky Way from all these, these surveys. Uh, and I won't go into much detail about all these, these are all the names, uh, but I'll say that uh, most of these turned out not to be black holes. Uh, and there are a variety of astrophysical false positives, uh, but most of them are just two luminous stars where the second star is hard to see for one reason or another. Uh, and it's rotating really rapidly, so its spectral lines get smeared out, or it had a different mass luminosity relation than you expect for so it's not in a binary. So you don't kind of color them by, by my level of confidence in them. Uh, but what I want to focus on for, for most of the talk uh, is developments in the last couple of years, thanks to the Gaia mission. Uh, and so it, if you haven't heard of it, or if you don't know too much about it, so Gaia is a, a mission in space run by ESA. And Gaia's main job is to monitor where, is to measure very precise positions of all the st stars. And the way it works is Gaia is rotating. So the camera sweeps out this annulus in the sky, but then the rotation axis processes. And so once a month or so, Gaia returns to every position in the sky and just measures very precisely where is the star now, has it moved since last month. Uh, and, and the amazing thing is it can do this with the precision of something like 100 to the milli arc second, so bright stars. Uh, and so to put that into context, so 100 to the milli arc second uh, is if I am in California and I point my telescope at New Jersey uh, and I see uh, human hair, that is 0.1 milli arc second. Yep. Um, what is the primary uncertainty in translating that 10 to the 8 figure for the number of solar mass black holes? Um, in the galaxy to uh, LIGO rays? Uh, there are many uncertainties. Uh, the, I mean, it's basically, a, we think of small fraction, some, somewhere between one in 100 and one in 1,000 black holes ever end up in that kind of a binary. And the biggest problem is that the progenitor of a black hole evolving in isolation will get to a radius of, of something like a uh, few thousand R sun. But in order to merge as a gravitational wave source, the two black holes need to be a few R sun apart. So both stars want to get much bigger than their final separation needs to be. And so they have to go through a common envelope, probably, or some or a stable mass transfer. And it's really the it's the binary interaction, but several parts of the binary interaction. There. So but then we understand the distribution in, you know, pick an arbitrary galaxy. We understand the distribution of like, progenitor stars. Uh, I think we understand. I mean, we we have a, we can say probably with factor of two or so uncertainty how many massive stars there were, but we can't say which ones in particular will turn turn into black holes. That's still basically a an unsolved problem in in, in predicting how compact you know which stars make the most compact progenitors or cores at the end, which ones successfully explode and which ones don't. Okay, so Gaia makes these incredibly precise measurements. And so if you have a star in a binary, uh, then after you do this for a few years, you get something like this, uh, where, you know, here I've removed the motion because of 
parallax and the fact that the star is moving through the galaxy. And so it just sweeps out uh, an ellipse. Um, and you can use this uh, to, to see whether you're you know, defined binaries and, and to measure the mass of the containers. Uh, so I, I thought I'd just talk through how this works, uh, a little bit of math. Uh, so imagine you have a star and a star orbiting a black hole or a dark object. And the semi matrix levels A star. So uh, Gaia measures basically the parameters of that ellipse. So maybe the period, semi major axis, also how far away it is, uh, the eccentricity. And then we have Kepler's third law. So we can take the period, uh, the mass of the star. So we need an estimate of the mass of the star, which we can try to do based on we know how bright it is, we know how far away it is. Uh, and then we'd like to solve for M2, right? Because we're looking for binaries where M2 is large. Uh, so we can we can almost do this. The only challenge is that the A that goes to Kepler third law is not A star, it's A1 plus A2. So you can rewrite this in terms of mass ratio, uh, which you get from conservation momentum, A, A2, M2, the A star, M star. Uh, and then you can basically solve for M2. So, so here you have uh, an equation that gives you M2 in terms of A star, which you can measure, period which you can measure, and then Q is M2 or M star. So if you know M star, you can solve for M2, which is what you want. Uh, so we're basically uh, done uh, as long as we can measure A star. Uh, but then you can ask what can go wrong. Uh, and the, the, center, the obvious thing that can go wrong is maybe your companion isn't dark. So if you have two stars, then Gaia won't be able to resolve the, the two stars. So it'll see something is wobbling, but what's wobbling is really the center of light between the two of them. So I'm going to call that that A, AL. Uh, and, and the good thing is that AL is always smaller than A star, which is even smaller than A. So if you measure AL and you think that your companion is dark, and you plug it into Kepler's third law and you get M2, you will underestimate the mass of the companion. And that, that's really why astrometry is, is powerful for looking for black holes and, and why we don't expect many of the same kind of false positives they were with other searches, is that if there's a luminous companion and you somehow don't detect it, you'll underestimate the mass of the dark of the companion. And so you won't think it's a black hole in the first place. Another way to think of that is dark companions give you much bigger orbits at fixed period than luminous companions. So this eliminates the vast majority of the false positives. Uh, okay, so uh, basically what we do, we take all the orbits from Gaia, we measure periods, the size of the photocenter ellipse, calculate M2 this way, and then we consider possibilities. Could you get uh, this big of a photocenter ellipse given a luminous star? Uh, if not, go to step two. Could you get this, this big of a photocenter ellipse given two luminous stars and type binary? So the thing is a triple, right? You will get a bigger ellipse then, a bit more mass and the same amount of light. Uh, but if, if the orbit is big enough, you can eliminate that also. And then it's basically a process of elimination. Uh, and if you can't think of anything else, then you say, well, the companion is a compact object. And then if it's, if it's too massive to be a new star, star uh, then, then probably it's a black hole. All right, so uh, a year and a half ago or so now, we got the third data release from, from Gaia, uh, which gave us uh, this sample of astrometric binaries. So it's something like 200,000 of them. I plotted here in, in orbital period. You'll notice there's a, a hole at a year because at a year period, or the orbital wobble is degenerate with parallax. And then I just compared it to the previous sample of astrometric orbits we had, uh, which is from Hipparchos. Uh, and so Hipparchos found 235 binaries, and Guy found 200,000. Uh, so it's a huge increase uh, just in, in the, the volume to search for rare objects. Uh, and of course, Hipparchos wasn't the only mission, but really, if you consider all pre-Gaia pre studies of binaries, the, kind, the kinds that gave us orbits that you can measure masses from, Gaia is about a factor of 50 increase in just in number of objects. And so that's good if you're looking for, for something rare. Uh, here on the right hand, you can see where those are on the color magnitude diagram, the observational HR diagram. Uh, and, and they're mostly solar type stars. And that's uh, basically a combination of the fact that Gaia is more sensitive to brighter, no, bright, uh, 
more massive stars are brighter. So all else equal, you're more likely to see uh, more massive stars, but there aren't very many bright stars. There aren't very many massive stars compared to low mass stars. And so the, the brightness sensitivity that guys are sensitive to now, like 15 to 60 magnitude, gives you something heavily weighted towards solar solar type stars. Uh, of course, for astrometry, it's important that they be close by because the size of that ellipse projected in the sky scales with distance. So it's basically a, it's an almost fair sampling of the solar neighborhood, uh, but you know, weighted up by, by brighter stars. So you get solar type stars mostly. Uh, so there are too many of those to, to get full up observation. And all of them, and we expect most of them are just two main sequence stars. So we calculate M2 using that kind of formula. Then we try to we look for objects where M2 is more than the mass of the luminous star and more than the Chandrasekhar mass. Uh, and so, so basically at least neutron stars, uh, maybe black holes is the hope. And so here you can, that cuts us down to something like 50 objects or so, which we can follow up. Uh, here you can see where they are in the color magnitude diagram, how bright they are, their orbital periods. The periods are typically fairly long, in a couple of years. Uh, based, that's because bigger or longer periods give you bigger orbits, which make bigger, uh, are easier to resolve in the sky. It means you have to be a little bit patient when you do the follow up. You don't get much change uh, from one night to the next. And they're pretty bright stars compared to, you know, they're, they're fainter than typical planet hosts, but much brighter than, than uh, most of the stars out there. Is it significant that they're biased faint? Uh, yeah, so so one thing you'll notice is lots of these, you mean compared to the CMD? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and so there are a couple of effects. One is that most of the astrometric binaries have two luminous stars in them. So on average, they're brighter than... I see, it's the uh, CMD that's biased. And that's part of it. But part of it is also that some of these will probably have much more printing means because we have, although the, the best fit mass is above 1.4, you know, you can, mm -hmm. no ways can push you over. And if you have a white dwarf companion, you know, get blue or this. Uh, okay, so uh, although Gaia, Gaia gives us nice constraints on these orbital ellipses, uh, but when you measure any parameter for a billion stars, all kinds of things can go wrong. And so the first step we have to check to make sure that they're correct. Uh, and, and the way we do that is by getting follow-up radial velocities. And the main way we've done this is basically using retired planet hunting telescopes. So the telescopes that were designed to find do one meter per second RVs around seventh magnitude stars. Instead, we're happy with 20 or 50 meters per second, but we can go fainter. And we, in practice, we do that by binning the data four by four or by eight. Uh, to, and, and so we can get pretty precise, you know, much more precise RVs than we really need down to the faintness limit of the giant sample. So, we have some astrometric orbit that makes a prediction for how the radial velocity should be changing. Then we measure RVs. Sometimes <laughs> the astrometric model wasn't very good. But this is why it's important to do radial velocity follow up. Like I said, with a billion, uh, billion sources, what can go wrong will go wrong. Uh, in other cases, uh, is that because the prediction is wrong, or is it just because there's some uncertainty in, in terms of orientation? Uh, I think in this case, it's just the prediction is wrong because, you know, what we're showing here is draws from the posterior. It's a little hard to see, but they're actually like 50 lines here and they're pretty tightly clustered. So basically the, the uncertainties do not reflect the disagreement between model and reality. So is this due to intimation or something? So I mean, like, what is the reason then why the models are changed? Uh, it's just that they, whatever model they fit is not the right model to describe the photocenter motion. The like most common failure point, I think, is when you have marginally resolved sources. You have two stars that are close to each other in the sky. And so when Gaia looks at them, you know, it tries to fit a one star PSF, but it's a little bit distorted each time. And most of the time, that'll just give you a, a nonsense result. But when you do that for a lot of objects, occasionally it just happens to look like. Um, and you can also have cases where Gaia makes a prediction for the RV, how the RV should change. But the prediction has gotten a little bit stale because the data guy had kept with several years earlier and there's some uncertainty in the period. Uh, but then you measure a few velocities, they look kind of consistent with the data, 
And then if you fit the velocities and the astrometry together, you get a good constraint on the orbit, even though you only had three velocities, which is not enough to fit an orbit by itself. Uh, so we've 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 been doing this now for the last year and a half or so, and I said most of our periods from Gaia are, are a few years. Uh, so we we have enough data now that we can constrain most of these orbits. Uh, and so so one of the first uh, exciting discoveries from this was a black hole. Uh, Gaia BH1, uh, and, and what's shown here uh, is the radial velocities now fitting radial velocities and astrometry together as right, a function of time and a function of phase. Uh, and you can see when you fit uh, astrometry is basically constrained in a 2D motion on the plane of the sky, or these are constrained in a third dimension. So when you put them together, you get a 3D constraint, uh, and you can measure the companion mass pretty precisely. Uh, so you get a a little over nine solar mass black hole, half a year orbit, uh, 1.4 AU separation, and, and, and pretty close to the sun, uh, 480 parsecs. So uh, for, uh, here's, a, here's a spectrum of, of the star orbiting black hole. Uh, the spectrum looks almost exactly like the sun, actually. So this is some other standard star, but if you, if you compare it to the spectrum of the sun, almost indistinguishable. Um, one of the things this tells you is that there's not light from another star there. In other ways, uh, you'd see some other spectral features, uh, but there's also not any pollution from supernova ejecta or anything like that. Uh, it's uh, the the orbit uh, of the star going around the Milky Way is is pretty normal. It's not you know it's not in a cluster. It, it didn't get a big kick flying flying out of the Milky Way. A uh, few good years old, so kind of. So basically, a, a totally, if you picked a star random out of the Milky Way, it would look like this, except that it has a, a black hole companion. What did you say the semi major axis was? 1.4 AU. <laughs> so, about pollution, is that what we expected? So, it depends how it forms. Uh, if uh, you probably don't expect much pollution if, if you, even if you have a successful explosion, just because the star subtends a small fraction of the sky as seen from the black hole if it goes in all directions. Uh, if you have mass transfer from the progenitor to the black to the companion first, uh, you might, it, it, but it depends on how, on what the nature of the mass transfer was. Uh, and so this is a very unequal orbit. So you expect probably the companion spirals through the star, through, or sorry, the companion spirals through the progenitor of the black hole. If, if it indeed formed through that channel. Uh, in that case, every, it's basically too fast for it to accrete much. Uh, so, right, one question is uh, what can go wrong? So, with, uh, one thing we, could, we, we can say, if, because for, from Gaia, right, we have parameters as ellipse. We see it matches the RBs, but we don't actually have the individual astrometric points. So, the first thing we try is just Let's get rid of astrometry completely and only fit the radial velocities. So that's what's done here. Uh, when you only fit radial velocities, you can measure a mass function. Uh, it's just called the mass function, but it's basically what would be the mass of the companion if the orbit were exactly edge on, uh, and if the mass of your star were zero, your star was a massless test particle. And in that, in this case, it's four solar masses. So four solar mass is the absolute minimum dynamical mass of the companion. And then uh, the inclination we get from the astrometric orbit is like 55 degrees. And we think the star is about one solar mass. And so when you include both of those, your full four solar mass becomes 10 solar masses. Uh, but we can just say, what if the inclination is straight or wrong, or the spectrum of the star were wrong, it's really massless, that it's still at least four solar masses. So then you just take the SED shown on the right there, uh, and compare it to a four solar mass star. And you see it's like a factor of, of a few hundred different all wavelengths. Uh, so it, it, it seems pretty uh, unambiguous that there is a, uh, well, we, we couldn't think of anything besides a, a black hole to make that much mass. Uh, and then given the good agreement between astrometry and RBs, we also believe the inclination. And so that's how we get a little over nine solar masses. I mean, it could also be two, two solar mass which would have a different SED. Uh, it would, but uh, in order to, you know, even even two, two even two two solar masses is much brighter than this. So 
you, you would need something like uh, 20 point point two solar masses. <laughs> Uh, okay, so supposing that this is this is uh, what it is, we have a one and a half uh, AU semi major axis around a ten solar mass black hole. How do you form that? Uh, so you might say, well, you just put whatever the progenitor of a ten solar mass black hole is, uh, where the star is today, and let it evolve. And so models tell us progenitor should be something like forty solar masses, but there's a pretty big uncertainty because. Turns out winds uh, remove most of the, the mass, even if you're higher masses, but 40 solar masses is the right ballpark. So I put a 40 solar mass star where the black hole is, and then play time forward, I, it gets too big. So uh, the maximum radius is something like 5 AU, and then uh, you wouldn't be able to fit the progenitor inside the orbit, uh, even if, uh, you know, even if you're optimistic about the, what, you know, the, as optimistic as you can be about the mass of the progenitor. So this is a generic problem for getting a star in a close orbit around a black hole, but there's also a problem for the LIGO sources. And so the normal solution is you say, well, it would have started farther out, or maybe it started out here. And then uh, when the progenitor overflows this Roche lobe, you have a common envelope, the star spirals inward, its orbital energy goes into ejecting the envelope, Maybe the envelope recombines and gets some extra energy. Uh, and so that, uh, again, if you're optimistic, will, will work. You might be able to get enough energy, although it is hard because the envelope weighs you know, at least 20 solar masses and your star is only one solar mass. Uh, but if that works, you basically expect the star to spiral in to the edge of the helium core. And so the, the challenge with this one is that it kind of it, if it formed this way, it spiraled in part way and then it stalled. And there's not any reason we can think of why it should stall. I, Up to that uh, distance, is the uh, binding energy of the orbit enough to uh, get rid of the envelope if it stopped at one point for a year? Uh, probably not. So there have been a few papers about this. It turns out the calculating binding energy of the envelope is, is non trivial. Uh, because it depends how much, you know, the envelope will recombine, which gives you some extra energy. But in general, red supergiants have fairly tightly bound envelopes compared to like AGB stars, which is the other case people have, have considered. Uh, so probably not. So uh, one way you can express that is calculating what is the alpha common envelope you need to plus six at this orbit, and it's like 15. And alpha is supposed to be less than one. Okay, so I... Uh, and you can think of other ways to make it. And the standard thing for binary is two stars that aren't enough. You say, well, what about three? <laughs> uh, so this work uh, done by my student Pranav. Uh, and and the, the basic idea here is if you start with two massive stars instead of one, they basically both terminate each other's evolution, or they, they run into each other when they try to evolve and stop each other from ever getting to the size of red supergiants. And because if they're both massive, you can have two episodes of stable mass transfer between them. Uh, you could even end up with two black holes rather than one. Because like, all they really know is there's a dark object there and total mass is about 10 or 9. Uh, we, we could split it between the two. Uh, and so uh, this is a model that you can test. Uh, and you can test it because if there's really two black holes, uh, the radial velocities of the star orbiting them will be a little different than if there's one. Uh, and so, you know, what's been shown here is a model. In the upper right, we've the Keplerian fit looks basically indistinguishable on that scale from the real RBs. But if you look at the residuals, they end up being significant. And there are basically two terms uh, in the residuals. One is, is this kind of short time scale oscillation on half the period of the inner binary. That's because the potential is like a dipole. Uh, and the other is longer time scale, which in this case is dominating because the inner binary processes, or rather the inner binary makes the outer orbit process. All right. And the nice thing about this star compared to other stars orbiting black holes is it's bright and it's slowly rotating with the sun-like star. So we know how to measure RBs for this kind of star with the precision to test this. Would these systems also have uh, <laughs> counterparts in Lisa or mid-band experiments? Uh, so at these periods, you're like 20 orders of magnitude too low in strain, right? Because it was like a year-long period. Mm -hmm. 
I, you might, I mean, at some point, some of these might end up in shorter periods. So uh, they might turn into things that could become lease sources. Uh, oh, oh, and I guess, so there I was talking about the, uh, the, the star in the black hole. The two black holes, uh, it, you don't really know the inner period. So if the inner period is really tight, then yes. But if it's so tight enough to see in Lisa, then it's going to merge pretty soon, you know. With, uh, and so the, you, it, it'd be uh, it'd be fine it'd be fine tuned to to be tight enough to be about to merge, but not have merged already. Do you understand what distribution you expect for the inner periods given this formation channel? Uh, yeah, you expect it to peak at something like a week period. Uh, it, it, I mean, there, there are uncertainties, but a week or a few weeks is kind of most likely. It is too long to merge in Humboldt time due to gravitational waves, right? So at yep. the peak of the distribution, they're not going to do that. Right. Okay. Okay, so we started getting high precision RVs using these instruments. You can get down to something like three meters per second. Uh, so here is now first, these are the same RVs that I showed uh, in the earlier slide. You can see they have scatter of a few kilometers a second. Uh, then I got rid of the less precise ones, and, and we, this now is, is precision of something like 100 meters per second. So this is from these two instruments, uh, Pharos and Trace, and high res. Uh, and now you can zoom in, you can say, well, is there residual, is there not? Uh, but then we also go down another order of magnitude. So you say, if there was scatter before, that was definitely noise dominated. You can zoom in again. <laughs> Uh, and basically, the answer is that as far in as we can zoom observationally, everything looks very consistent with Keplerian orbit plus uh, noise. Uh, and so we can quantify, we can set a limit on the period of inner binary if it exists from that. And so you can imagine the bigger the inner binary, the larger the residual, because in the limit of a really short inner binary period, it just looks like a point mass. And so the point here basically is how good of a fit can you get with a two star model and the function of period of the inner binary? And so, and then the dashed line is the fit that we got. And so we can rule out inner periods more than a day and a half. So we can't rule out less than a day and a half, but at less than a day and a half, you merge in a few billion years. Uh, and so, you know, it's possible that it's there, but it would require some fine tuning. These are some both have the same mass or something. Uh, I think here we one of these is varying the mass ratio, but basically anywhere between neutron star and five solar masses. Okay, so that was Sky Beach one. Then we found another one. Okay, sorry. So about this after, so that, do we know if it has uh, an outer tertiary? Yeah, good question. So based on these RVs, we also get some constraint on lack of tertiary, so that it can't be there. If it's a tertiary, it can't be closer than like 20 years or something, otherwise that would perturb the inner orbit. Uh, and then based on that, there's not a, there's not a resolve companion in Gaia. Uh, and then I think we were going to, but never, but didn't actually do second yet. So it's possible, I mean, it's possible that there's a companion at, I think at like 50 or 100 AU that we wouldn't have detected. Yeah. So I'm curious if we do have the auto tertiary, does that also help you to like explain how it forms? It could help. Uh, let's see. Well, I think it's not easy because the or inner orbit isn't tight enough to have been captured that periastron in a cosine thing. Uh, but there may still be some kind of other channel here. So before you go to BH2, then how did it form? You just eliminated the alternative. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'll talk about some other possibilities, uh, but we don't know. So, but it could have formed using your, ter your your triple mechanism and then merged, and it's now sitting there post merge. It's possible, but a merger you normally get, you think. Yeah. Well, Normally it would, yeah. But what's the typical velocity uh, of the orbit? Maybe it did get a kick. Maybe the eccentricity that you're getting is post kick. Uh, yeah, it's possible. So I think you can have a kick up to 50 kilometers a second or so in state band. Yeah. I, I think for, for these kind of black holes, it, when it's typical mass ratio, there's a few hundred kilometers a second for the post merger kick. Right. Okay, so still fine tuning. Gotcha. Okay. There's no spin. <laughs> not, no, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we found another one. Uh, qualitatively similar picture 
even wider orbit. So phi day u, uh, but still probably too small to fit a red supergiant inside without interaction. Uh, so you can put these two systems on this plot. This is orbital period versus distance. All the red points are X-ray binaries. So not surprisingly, those are at shorter periods because they're X-ray bright. These are longer periods. Uh, but then Y-axis is distance, and we think distance is kind of a proxy for how common is this kind of system. Uh, and, and you see both of these are, are now the closest known black holes. So if there were X-ray binary closer than them, we would be it would be bright, we would see it. Uh, and so we think uh, these systems are more common than X-ray binary, which isn't surprising because they started by saying X-ray binary is a rare outcome of, of binary evolution. Uh, but they're underrepresented in, until now because you can only find them if you have to get a lot of radio velocities or really precise astrometry. Uh, of course, we, we, we thought uh, they're not detected in X-rays initially, but it can't hurt to look. Uh, because of course the you know there is some wind from the star the black hole will get some of that so we looked at X-ray and radio my student uh, Tony Rodriguez uh, but there's no no photons detected uh, this isn't isn't uh, especially surprising but you do you only get this if you if in an ADAF basically so uh, you you need an ADAF and you need most of the you need the accretion rate at the horizon. To be much less than the Bondi rate, which is what people have predicted, uh, uh, but uh, seems to be true. Uh, one interesting uh, connection to the X-ray binaries is that in a few years these will become X-ray bright, because right now the stars are small, but they will evolve, fill their Roche lobes, and both of them we expect to have stable mass transfer for a few million years uh, onto the black hole, uh, and so. A few million years is short compared to the average lifetime of these systems, but if they're stably mass transferring, we should be able to see them as X-ray sources with a red, at a red giant uh, all throughout the galaxy. Uh, and so the ratio of the X-ray bright lifetime to not X-ray bright lifetime is something like one in a thousand, which means you should find, you know, for every thousand of these, one of them should have a giant. It should be detected in an X-ray. And so we think there should be some systems like this in the Milky Way that, that aren't discovered yet. Uh, and so Tony is now looking for them in E. Rosita, uh, just, just based on the occurrence rate that we get from the, the few we found with Gaia. There should be some farther away that have giants. Uh, so another way, one way you can make them avoiding binary evolution is dynamically. So basically you put them in a cluster, uh, start, you have a binary with two main sequence stars, and the black hole swoops in and ejects one of the main sequence stars. Uh, and this can work. There have been a few papers about it, uh, but they're all very complicated pictures with, with many characters. Uh, and I'm not uh, totally convinced so far uh, because most of the channels that people see, all the channels here, they don't actually fundamentally get around the problem of which was this common envelope. You see, you still have a common envelope, still have a common envelope. The only difference is because you we're in this cluster environment. You had you had a merger first, and so the the star is a merger product with different core envelope structures. The envelope is a little less bound, uh, but there doesn't seem to be a an easy clean channel with a high enough rate where you just pair up the black hole and star after they form. So, can you say again, like in a nutshell, what exactly is the problem with having to go through common envelope because they stall at some fine tuned radius? Is that the main issue? Yeah, it's well. It's basically you have to eject all the envelope above you, right. and it doesn't seem like there's enough. Alpha is not it's less than one. That's so it's possible that red supergiant envelopes at some points are just much less weakly bound, or are much more weakly bound, much less bound than we think. Uh, yeah. Okay. And I guess the eccentricity would also constrain it. I think the so the eccentricity is around 0.5 both of them. I think that could. Uh, Does that work with common envelope? Uh, it might. I mean, so common envelope probably makes you a little eccentric. Uh, you might get circuit. You know, you might get, but then you get some kick when the black hole forms, probably. Uh, so I think it's it's not disqualifying. <laughs> um, one of the reasons I'm not so convinced about the the uh, the dynamics uh, is that we also find a lot of 
binaries in similar orbits where the compact orbit is the main sequence star. This is work uh, done by my student Natsuko Yamaguchi. And so you can see here are just the ones of the spectroscopic follow up core, but we now we have like 3,000 of them now. These are just the ones with the most data. We have a white dwarf main sequence star at periods of a year or a couple of years. So similar, uh, they're still too small to, to fit in an AGB star inside. So it seems like there has to have been some interaction. Two short periods to be stable mass transfer given the mass of the white dwarf. Uh, and so you see they're very different periods than the periods where we found post common envelope binaries before. So these are normal post common envelope binaries. They're much wider. Uh, and we just weren't sensitive to the orbits before Gaia. So uh, nobody worried about them. But, but now there's a significant sample of them. Uh, and so just modeling the selection function of, of these objects uh, and some other ones uh, studied it with, with Kepler. Natsuko finds that something like one in every hundred solar type stars as a white dwarf companion at about in the U. So it's a pretty high rate. It's something like 20% of all the white dwarfs in the universe are in these kind of wide orbits around solar type stars. Uh, and, and those orbits are mostly circular. So those are not dynamically formed. Uh, and so my feeling is that there's some way to eject, um, to eject envelopes more efficiently uh, than is captured in, in populations in this model, or even in, 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 in simulations of, of individual objects with, with MESA and things like that, or in hydro simulations so far. Uh, so we talked about black holes, we talked about white dwarfs, last thing is neutron stars. So neutron stars are tricky because they're about 1.4 solar masses, and white dwarfs can get almost that massive. But we've been following up everything uh, with masses around there. And by now we have about 20 objects where the constraint on the mass is above the Chandrasekhar, is, is a, at least a little bit above the, the Chandrasekhar mass. Uh, with our first cut, I think something like 10 of them are above the Chandrasekhar mass and the rest are above 1.3. Um, I'll say where we got that limit. Uh, so here's a lot of orbits. Remember each one of these rate of velocity points is somebody staying up for a night. So it's, so, it's a lot of work. Uh, one of the reasons we think, so uh, so actually here you see that the cutoff we did, what we decided to probably call neutron star was 1.25 solar masses. Uh, and the reason for that is that most of, but not all, as I talked about this morning, but most of the things above that mass have higher eccentricities than lower mass things. Right? right? Most of the white dwarfs are not quite circular orbits, but they're low-ish eccentricities. So it's like they got circularized, at least partially during mass transfer. Uh, but for neutron stars, even if you get circularized, you probably have a kick afterward. And um, so you expect to have these higher eccentricities. Uh, and so this makes us reasonably confident that a significant number of these are neutron stars. But for any given one, it's, it's hard to say for sure whether it's a neutron star or a massive white dwarf. Sorry, so for the white dwarf, how many of them actually have very low? It's in like almost zero. So is, is there any like circularization that can happen? And Sorry, for the white dwarfs or for the? Uh, for the, uh, the red dots. Yeah, they're right. Uh, actually, almost like. Yeah, so those are ones we think are white dwarfs. So the naive expectation from binary evolution is that all the white dwarfs should be exactly zero eccentricity at these periods because they get circularized by tides going through giant. Uh, and that should be the end of the story. Uh, so the surprising thing actually is that most of them are not consistent with zero, although they're low. Uh, and we don't really understand where that you know, eccentricity might. Uh, yeah, there, are, there are lots of ideas which I'm going to, but, but we don't really understand where they're concerned. So these white dwarfs, you're sure they're white dwarfs or just based on this criteria? Uh, this is just based on a cut at 1.25. So I know they're not, I know they're dark, if they're normal stars, I'd be able to see them, but they could be low mass neutron stars or yeah, I mean, <laughs> anything else. All, all we have is a mass. So are there no error bars on the high eccentricity? They are, they're just small. Oh, small. Okay. Uh, yeah, so one object we found that, that was particularly puzzling is, is uh, this one, which we talked about this morning. So it's uh, the most circular and the most massive of our neutron stars. So it's 1.9, electricity of, of almost zero in two year orbit. Uh, and again, it doesn't matter. To, we can base almost throw out the Gaia data uh, because uh, even, even without astrometry, we were well above the Chandra safeguard mass. So uh, one of the things that's puzzling about this is how to get such a circular orbit. And so 
you don't really know what the progenitor of the neutron star was, but you can have some guess based on its mass. So you say, what if, you know, uh, what if the neutron star initially was a helium star that's five solar masses, right? And then it, it collapses, outer envelope of the helium star gets blown off, uh, it goes down to 1.9, uh, and the, the binary won't survive because the mass loss is, you know, suddenly there's not enough gravity to hold on to the star during its orbit, so it'll go on down. Uh, I say, okay, maybe it was a lower mass helium star, maybe it was only three solar masses, which is actually lower than people expect makes this, this mass the neutron star, but could be. The three solar masses just collapses, it will stay unbound, or sorry, it'll stay bound, but you'll get a higher eccentricity. So basically the only way you can get a low eccentricity like this uh, is very little kick, very little mass loss, uh, or you can have very fine-tuned kicks that exactly chase the, st the other star as it escapes. And so here's a simulation showing that. Basically, you have 100% survival probability of no kick in your mass loss. But even if you only have a 10 kilometer a second kick, your probability of getting this low eccentricity is a few percent. And if it goes up to 20 kilometers a second, it's, it's less than a percent. So uh, given we only found one, one massive object like this, uh, the puzzle, but it seems to suggest uh, very little mass loss, very little kick. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about this mass, so there are other neutron stars that are this massive, there are some of them, uh, but they're all recycled, meaning they've accreted from a companion, usually a white dwarf, and they've been spun up with their millisecond bullseyes. But this one, the companion is a main sequence star, definitely no, hasn't accreted anything for it. Uh, and so the, the Population to compare it to is the non recycled neutron star, which is shown in cyan here, has more massive than any of those. Uh, so it, it seems like uh, a case of a neutron star born well above 1.4 solar masses, which is theoretically not, not shocking. We do expect neutron stars to be uh, born with masses above 1.4, but based on uh, most of the other well measured neutron stars before, uh, it seems like most of them are born close to 1.4. Okay, last last slide, and then I, I know I'm getting toward the end. I talked about this mass gap at the beginning. And so with Gaia now, we have a decent constraint on the mass distribution of dark companions that are in these kind of binaries. So we have these two black holes, both around nine solar masses, 20 or so neutron stars, all less than two, and a gap in between them. Uh, and it's harder to detect a, a 1.4 solar mass dark object than a five solar mass dark object, right? Because it, it makes a smaller ellipse. So if there was a significant population of five solar mass black holes, we would see it. Uh, it is, it's easier to detect a, a nine solar mass black hole than a five. So, so there could be a few low mass black holes, but they have to be rare compared to neutron stars. And, and, and you can't have a, a black hole mass distribution that increases for lower masses and for ones in these kind of binaries. Okay. Uh, here's a map of all the black holes uh, uh, that, that we know of. So we've got these two in, in, that we found with Gaia. They're too close to X-ray binary, a little farther away. Uh, but there's Zeta off, which I started with, the nearest O star. And so although we found ones that are now closer than we found before, they're still much farther away than we think the closest one should be. But even the data off, there should be a thousand black holes for every star like that. So if we could see all of them, you know, we wouldn't be able to see anything else. So many black holes everywhere. Uh, most of those are apparently are not in the kinds of binaries that we've got right now. Okay, all right, I'll end there. Okay, okay we have time maybe for a couple of questions. I guess you made this argument that since we have this postar that's very nearby, um, of course, you know, the black holes, we should expect to see tons of them. But I guess this is assuming that these stars are sort of probably distributed in the Milky Way. Is that a fair assumption to make? Uh, they're not exactly isotropically distributed, but they're, they're mostly in the plane of the Milky Way. Mm -hmm. So there's one, the closest one I said was like 100 parsecs, the next one is like 110 parsecs, the next one is like 100. There, there are, uh, there are many, many boost stars that are closer to us than the black hole we've had so far. Uh, yes, my question is the whole beginning. 
uh, there are, I think that practically more than half a dozen of uh, binaries, I must, binaries with uh, black holes, but transient, which are bright once in several years, but extremely bright, we measure everything. Are this system detected by Gaia? Yeah, good question. So uh, they're, they do not have astrometric orbits. Oh, and, and they have for, oh, Gaia has it. Yeah. So, I mean, so Gaia, so Gaia sees the star, but it doesn't detect the motion of the star on the black hole. And it's just because they're relatively close orbits. They're, no, there are orbits. Uh, some orbits have period more than one year. Uh, with black holes? Yes, with black holes. Okay, there are, I don't believe it. Formulate in different ways. There are more than 200 transients, especially in small Magellanic uh, cloud, where we know neutron star. We know that this neutron yeah. star around B star. You understand? Yeah. Yes. And my question is the following Do we detect this object? Because they are, they are always visible for Gaia. Mm -hmm. they are. The universe is rather high, B stars. Yeah. And uh, there are certainly neutral stars because we thought there are extra pulsars or, you know, dusters and so on. Yeah. yeah. So we do detect all the, the B E stars are detected. And the Magellanic Cloud is too far away because the. Oh, but these are bright objects. Yeah, but the problem is not that they're faint, but that the size of the orbit goes down as one over distance. Right, the angular size of the orbit is smaller at this distance. So I think there are some B X-ray binaries in the Milky Way. In all galaxy, yes, but these are several. But eighty-one object is just concentrated in small Magellanic cloud. Yeah, so they're there. Recent star formation. Yeah, I, I, I believe they're there, uh, but the the angular size of the orbit is much smaller than. But for uh, for object GX three hundred one, maybe on this well known system. It's also of the order of one year orbit, and uh, there is object and uh, it's possible. You nobody tried to find this object. I understood so. I think that's true. I mean, part of it is we have a neutron star and a massive star. The neutron star doesn't move very much. Or sorry, the, the massive star doesn't move very much because the neutron star is less massive. So the astrometric wobble is, is not so big. Uh, but I, that's a, the, the, I, I, my guess is a few of the BE X-ray binaries in the Milky Way are close enough that they that they're detected, but but I'm not sure. And the addition of creation, it's more technical. Uh, Gaia is has extremely interesting orbit, you know, which is not scanning a sky all time. Yes, but uh, it is very sophisticated orbit, and uh, only after five or seven years. It will cover whole sky. And then the problem is to make the coverage of the sky uniform. When will be this moment when sky will be covered uniformly? Uh, well, it'll never be totally uniform. There are always parts of the sky that get more scans than other places. I mean, it has already covered the whole sky several times. Oh, no, the whole sky is not oh, quasi uniformly, the whole sky is covered. Yes. Well, all the sky has been looked at some, but the amount of time looking in different parts is different. But, but uh, so the total mission will be like 11 years. Uh, it's already almost done. Guy's already taken like 10 years worth of data, but it's not, what's published is only three years. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's all, every part of the sky has guy observations and uh, it's just not equal depth everywhere. It's the same with other spacecraft. I thought that this uh, revolutionary orbit should give us something special. Yeah. How, we're talking, so how many more black holes do you expect from Gaia? I, 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 quite a few. Uh, so just based on, so what they published in DR3 is very conservative. Based on the space density we get from the two, uh, and then if we assume a uh, Reasonable uh, detection limit for DR4, we we expect a border 100, uh, you know, 10, 10 to 100, I'd say. What is the mass uh, like range you would be able to obtain the signal? Uh, basically anything. I mean, we can detect neutron stars, and the bigger the orbit, the better for, like, the bigger the mass, the better for the orbit at fixed period. So the main limit is periods. So right now we're only sensitive. You know, we're more sensitive to long periods, up to a thousand days. And beyond a thousand days, guy doesn't see a full orbit. Year four, it'll be two thousand days, but it's more data. 
So I think eventually it should be pretty good census from you know one AU to thirty AU or so. I'm asking more on the high end, high mass and uh, the seven. Yeah, I mean ten to the four, ten to the five. So like if if it has a close, if it has a star in a close orbit, we'll see it, no problem. Uh, it just uh, most likely if the period is too long, then. then are any of the neutron stars um, potentially pulsars or within observations to? Uh, yeah, we're doing a follow up program now. Uh, so if they are, we'll see. Uh, we start out pessimistic because the uh, typical lifetime is a few giga years, and the neutron stars are only pulsars for a few million years. Uh, but it would be nice if you know if we had a pulsar orbit, we could do much more. Okay, so uh, let's uh, thank Karim once again.